Remember how two weeks ago I did a series-wide retrospective on Sonic? This week it's Snook. Coincidence? Who knows? But what people might find harder to remember is that SNK games used to be the kings of the arcade. Scrolling through any given arcade during their golden era of the 90s saw them regularly squaring off for the most popular machines against none other than Capcom. A rivalry that had the two companies responding to each other's games, names, characters, and franchises with an amount of humility that's a bit uncommon in the Japanese gaming industry. Not only did they trade staff and ideas off of each other, but they also began collaborating on crossovers as the glory days of arcade gaming waned away into consoles. Regardless, SNK eventually lost that battle with its weak foothold in home console gaming, but their back and forth swaps for arcade supremacy produced a lineup of some of the greatest fighting, shooting, and even sports games ever, each one with what may still be the best pixel art in the business. So when they released a Humble Bundle last December with 24 games at a minimum buy-in of $10, I couldn't wait to check them out and make a video about it. Unfortunately, you get what you pay for. Dot Emu acquired what looked like very fishy versions of these ROMs, but it's okay because they had SNK's permission. Then they pasted them into a bare bones front loader with Game Taps emulator that doesn't even give you the option to rebind controls. Then they failed to troubleshoot for common bugs like games playing at high speeds at high monitor refresh rates. But I guess when you're paying a minimum rate of 25 cents a game for what used to be quarter-guzzling arcade machines with home versions of 200 plus dollars each, I shouldn't really be complaining. So that means I have... 32! ...minutes to go through 24 games here, so let's get started. SNK's 25th anniversary collection is a Neo Geo collection, meaning it begins rather weakly without the earlier hits of Akari Warriors and Baseball Stars since they were on different systems. Instead, we begin with 1991's King of the Monsters, a bombastic tribute to kaiju movies as a fighting game and a regular choice on Nick Arcade. But what I didn't expect was this to be a wrestling game, with your costumed monster of choice using grapples and throws, Irish whips and German suplexes to force the other into a three second pin to win. Combine that with stage hazards and throwable helicopters for a game that's got style but not grace. Jumping is handled by a button combination, even though button D isn't really used. Plus, you've got this real problem of animations under telegraphing move inputs, sacrificing finesse in the name of good old fashioned arcade button mashing. Holding the punch activates a throw, I, I think? It doesn't always work. Mashing a direction and holding a button reverses a throw, or is it holding a direction and mashing the button? In 30 minutes with unlimited quarters, I couldn't figure out the details. This thing would have been an audiovisual treat, but trying to take it seriously would have just been a waste of quarters. It's a flashy, short, and quick game for the arcades, just like Baseball Stars 2, except this one's a hell of a lot more enjoyable. It's a polished and snappy season of anime league baseball where suddenly SNK's pixel work got really, really good. Proportions are super top heavy, and everyone's facial expressions are focused as hell. And you definitely get your quarters worth here. With some dedication, you can play a full 9 inning game against a friend, or a huge 15 game season where each quarter buys you more time as the season goes on. But just like the last time, you're playing with a sense of control that's pretty vague. The tutorial window stays up for a whopping 3 seconds, and what, what the hell is that? No other SNK game glosses over its controls as fast as this one, let alone do they have the multi-role complexity of baseball either. But there's nothing complicated about these controls once you learn them, as well as discover the finesse that is there with button holds and combinations for extra moves. And that makes it an incredible game to play with a friend, but not so much when you're against an AI when your own sense of the controls is the only thing to blame for a mysterious amount of good hits turning into foul balls. Which brings us to the first of many fighting games in this collection, Fatal Fury Special, which is the updated year after version of Fatal Fury 2. Okay. 
Fatal Fury was SNK's more deliberate response to the happy accident that was Street Fighter 2, and with the creator of the original Street Fighter at the helm, plus lessons learned from SF2, you have a game that released instantly neck and neck with the fiercest of competitors. What is a slow and simple fighter by today's standards was rousing back then, when stacked against the likes of Mortal Kombat and Primal Rage. After all, the competition between Street Fighter, Fatal Fury, and the later KOF games defined competitive fighters as we know them today, starting with focusing on combo building systems and strategic specials. But for Fatal Fury, we do have a huge spotlight on what has totally become a gimmick feature, this two-lane switching. The sprites don't scale smoothly on their way in and out of the background, and contextual inputs mean you and your opponent can be locked into flying back and forth at each other forever. But that is rectified with excellent backgrounds that change time of day as the fight goes on, and the debut of SNK's roster of fun, charismatic mascots, and this dude riding a fish. So you have enough style and energy to make what was, at the time, a sublime presentation. We also have a brutally hard default difficulty. The AI knows how to counter just about everything you can throw at it, but with so much to learn and the experience of it being as enjoyable as it is, I had a blast going back to this one. So it's weird that AOF2's default difficulty is a hell of a lot more fair. This game has a style that's slightly toned down and a two-button system that's much more simple. A is punch, B is kick, and the length of holding each one determines their speed and strength. It's a more accessible and easy game, but it's one that's also lacking the bombastic, over-the-top style of its SNK contemporaries, even though it still tries. Don't do it, brother! That man is... Uh, that man is our... You've got a cheesy story, some hard rock chip tunes, stylish characters, but the energy of the presentation just isn't cranked up to 11 like it is in the other games. Without as many buttons or systems as Fatal Fury, it also feels like there's less to learn, and less visual polish too. Characters can't decide if they want to look like real people or anime people, and that lack of polish is also seen in this revolutionary camera scaling system, which would turn out to become standard over time, but back then it seems to be implemented as an awkward footnote in the sprite size wars, to the point where sprites are damn near one third of the screen. The camera zooms in so far that it has to make fast jerky motions to keep up, and at distance these beautiful sprites turn into pixelated messes. It just can't win either way. It's still fun, but there's no way it stacks up against standard setting contemporaries like Samurai Showdown 2, which is basically another SNK fight 'em up but with swords. Which means everyone's moves generally reach longer, hit harder, and sway in and out of motion smoother than with fisticuffs. Which gives the fights a nice sense of visual motion and flow. It's easier to telegraph a new attack when a guy has to swing a long object in and out of it. The use of weapons also means that clashing swords bounce off each other, and it gives room for a whole second move set when you're disarmed. But Samurai Showdown's more basic innovations to the genre as a whole include rolls, ducks, short hops, and the same kind of parry system that made Third Strike so awesome. There's hilarious English, grisly fatalities, and an overwhelming amount of personality and charm. All good qualities that are missing from Polestar, one of the most heinously difficult, sluggish, and visually messy shmups I've ever played. There are three deadly sins committed here in this arcade atrocity. Number one is how painfully slow your ship is, starting at a snail's crawl that can only be mildly upgraded, leaving your default state of play incredibly vulnerable and unresponsive. Number two is how hard it is to tell what's even hitting you. A lot of hazards blend into the background or foreground colors, and what counts as dangerous isn't consistent. Solar flares are fine, but exhaust flares are not. Water is fine, but walls are not. This giant flaming piece of wreckage that's easily avoidable is totally safe to fly through. And number three is that in order to give some girth to your shots, you gotta mash ridiculously fast. So get ready for sore thumbs. You know, it's totally fine being a hard arcade game, I get it, I kinda like the challenge of these SNK games and shmups in general, but they're supposed to be hard and fair, and, and Polestar just isn't fair. No amount of shoddy pre-rendered GeoCities GIFs plastered all over the place can save this one. Next. Mission one, start. 
pre-rendered pseudo 3D effects were an experiment far away from the company's core hallmarks of outlandish style with brilliant pixel art, which is why Metal Slug may be SNK's most recognizable brand. In 1996, they were proving that no one needed no stink in 3D when you had pixel art as good as this. Metal Slug is a tech demo of artistry. It's a hurricane of detailed pixels. It's the next generation of low tech. And I don't know if it's my jam for all of those reasons. Metal Slug's focus on style over substance means you have a very sluggish sense of control for what is definitely an early hardcore bullet hell. All those frames of buttery smooth animation need to be shown off, so the whole thing plays like you have moon gravity on. Animations are slow, and unfortunately so is the frame rate. The developers had to pay for this ridiculous animation budget not just in performance, but also from their pockets, so this visually spectacular, attention-stealing game is also a ruthless quarter muncher. Your slow movement combined with your big hitbox gradually runs through levels of unrelenting bullet spam. Sure, you could do it all on one quarter, but it would take about 60 to untold hundreds of dollars to practice to get up to that level. An experience that's remedied with the unlimited quarters of home console releases, which suddenly turn Metal Slug into a placid, almost cathartic romp through one of the most chaotic half-hours in gaming. It's an experience that's the polar opposite of Neo Turf Masters, which, believe it or not, was made by the same Nazca studio. Going back to SNK's style of sport seen in Baseball Stars 2, we have a simplified version of Anime League Golf with a generous amount of game time bought for each quarter and a different set of 18 holes played across four courses. Unfortunately, though, there's not as much to say about this one. It's golf, a stop-and-go game of simple math and simple reflexes better suited for tipsy conversations with a bar friend than anything demanding serious concentration. Its almost one-button control scheme is pure elegance, a lack of difficulty that's compensated by rugged courses that almost play like putt-putt rather than a serious golf game. Although that seems to be the theme here, even though SNK style still means it's a hell of a lot more hyperactive. I love the announcer. Once again, we're making a harsh contrast to lead into Ironclad, another pre-rendered shmup akin to Polestar that ditches pixel art in the name of bland 90s CG. And like Polestar, it's also one of the few second party titles on this list that wasn't made by Nazca. Except this one actually has some interesting ideas behind it than just raw difficulty. Your charge shot releases a little bot who effectively switches you into an alternate playing mode, with less beam width traded off for overall fire coverage, with a couple seconds of vulnerability between switching modes since you gotta hold a button to reset. You also can take up to four hits and hold two different kinds of charge shots, which is a bit of a shame since most of the other aspects of this shooter are completely lacking in character. Most of the time. You also have this amateurish lack of perspective. One moment your ships are half the size of houses. Over the next few minutes, they're cramming into doorways to fit into a sewer, bursting into secret meeting rooms, and crashing into this crazy transforming organ boss. Which is ridiculous, and also great. But most of the time, you're scrolling past much blander designs, so let's get back to pixel art. This might not be what I had in mind. Yeah, somehow I feel like I'm not the target demographic here. Regardless of who exactly this game was aiming for, Twinkle Star Sprites is actually a pretty neat game. It's a competitive head-to-head -head vertical shmup, and my sources tell me that Toho tried a thing like this one year later with the Phantasmagoria of Dim Dot Dream. Both players shmup it up as usual, except you actually want to be paying attention to where you're shooting, since enemies caught in splash damage glide over into the other screen, where they can then be shot back at the original player who shot them first. So the two of you are playing a game of manic tennis, where occasionally you get to slap enemies and eventually bosses to the other side, while also dodging problems of your own, occasionally to that same sound effect that the far side used in Perfect Dark. Shock Troopers is the spirit of an entire era condensed into one picture-perfect, nostalgia-ready image. When I think arcade game and close my eyes, this is what I see. It's a gem in their crown, it's proof of a late 90s winning streak that saw SNK's in-house devs at the top of their game. 
You've got thumpy D&B music, unlimited bullets, a preposterous army of bad guys who walk into them into a gory mess, and this chick named Milky for a picture-perfect promenade of 90s arcade insanity. The top-down perspective, responsive controls, and fast action all feel like a spin on the Metal Slug concept that's more palatable to my tastes. And the game's own impressive pixel art keeps it looking good, too. And this game came straight out of the blue. No one talks about it. I never heard about it. Honestly, go out on the streets and ask anyone, hey, remember how awesome Shock Troopers was? And they won't know what the hell you're talking about. Which is a shame. No one ever seems to hype up Shock Troopers. Or The Last Blade either, which is another absolutely beautiful specimen of a video game. One where the team took an uncharacteristic step towards a more somber tone. Melancholy music, windswept backgrounds, and these understated but powerful little cinematics that the game uses as loading screens create a tone that's a little grim and almost dramatic. <laughs> The era of stupidly good-looking fighting game backgrounds is in full swing. And believe it or not, Last Blade was originally regarded as a throwback, as a spiritual successor to Samurai Showdown. There were only two Last Blades and something like 12 Samurai Showdowns, depending on how many spin-offs you want to count. Anyways, this time diagonal roll inputs and a fourth attack button are traded out for command rolls and a parry button which totally changes the way defensive play works since you now can't rely on the other player to turtle up and take your chip damage. If cornered, you'll spot plenty of windows to escape anyways, as this is one of the slower Street Fighter 3 era fighters on this list, even though you might not notice because there are just so many darn frames drawn in for everyone's animations. You've got selectable speed and orgy modes, which unlock advanced super desperation moves and super cancels, but you don't gotta worry about any of that, because normal combos feel so fluid and satisfying that no other game before this comes close. And despite this huge step up in quality, 97 and 98 are also years that really show what an isolated ecosystem SNK's games had uh, kind of become. With the hurdles of early 3D design now working their way out, the latest generation of home consoles were making 3D masterpieces to define the late 90s. So the Neo Geo's dated hardware from 1990 had to impress in different ways, like cramming as many moving sprites on the screen as possible. And thus we have Blazing Star, a prototypical bullet hell borrowing from the earlier successes of Cave and Treasure games while actually getting pretty close to the standards that those companies' modern releases meet. Seriously, I was playing Crimson Clover last year, which came out in like 2011, and here we have a game from 1998 that almost had everything cool about future shmups figured out. You've got a screen of oblong, neon-colored bullets slowly moving and sticking out like hell from the background. The player's high damage output makes gameplay more about concentrating on dodging rather than shooting, and you've got spectacle. Explosions everywhere, giant robots everywhere, exploding giant robots everywhere, and everything's all scrolling by so fast that there's never a dull moment. The only elements that this game's missing that would make it feel not dated at all are the now requisite speed throttling and a screen clearing bomb. A shield of upgradable size is implemented as the desperate difficulty crutch, and that works well enough. I actually really enjoyed this one, and recommend checking out the Humble Bundle release if you're getting into bullet hells. Especially since it's a notch easier than a lot of the other entry-level manic shooters. Which is a category Metal Slug 2 might fit better than the first. This game is more lighthearted and more ridiculous, which means there's more both to laugh and gasp at. Plus, it's designed to be much less quarter-munching, with most of the game laid out in a way that actually gives you a chance, sometimes in surprising ways. You've got a couple new movesets for a couple new vehicles, which is to be expected, but uh, eat a bunch of food and suddenly you have a new character. Get hit by a mummy and suddenly you have a new character. And a second chance. This Metal Slug's half hour is full of more stop and go challenges with diverse set pieces bookmarked by familiar elements. It's a more tightly designed set of levels overall, but it was infamously botched by the game's original release, which launched with a crippling optimization error that has the first few seconds reach new lows of frame rate slowdowns. Problems that are remedied by the only re release addition to this collection, but before they push that one out, we've got the first King of Fighters in this collection. The King of Fighters 98 is generally agreed to be the fan favorite of the series. Although what's odd about playing SNK games in chronological order is that it looks like this one's taking a step back in fidelity and pixel artistry from the last few games. That's because KOF is a compilation fighter, a crossover of character sprites from SNK's many other franchises to create a big ultimate crossover dream match of characters from Fatal Fury, Art of Fighting, and even shmups like Ikari Warriors. 
On top of having a shitload of characters, it's also one of the most complicated mainstream fighters out there. While Street Fighter excels in competitive elegance, KOF demands a mastery of complexity. It's a team fighter, and your meter rolls over between matches, so you want to line your people up in the opposite order of whose supers you know best. You've got about four different lengths and times of jumps to input, a button combo with iframes, cancel rolls, and special moves branch out into conflicting subcategories of cancelable, meter usable, proximity unlockable, counter hit corner cross ups, and max man hyperdrive neo max cancel. And oddly enough, that sheer dedication to complexity lends these games a healthy degree of control, and that may be why I've been more of a KOF guy than a Street Fighter guy. I may never be good enough at Street Fighter to go up against the pros, but after a few days spent learning the intricacies of any KOF, I'll at least feel like one. And now we're back at Fatal Fury. They were still making these games within the Real Bout spin-off series. This old SF2 clone with the two-lane switch gimmick now has a new coat of assets that are up to par with the updated resolution and fidelity standards set by The Last Blade. This time, another SNK 4 button fighter is actually trimmed down to 3 buttons. Button 4 is now exclusively used for background switching as opposed to the 2 button combination of earlier. And despite having its own button, that whole background switching system is now treated as somewhat of an afterthought, a design nuisance, an acknowledged gimmick in an age where 2D fighters had converged on standard features. Some stages here don't let you jump into the background at all, and whenever you do, you can only input a move that'll launch you straight into the foreground. Plus, the switch doesn't chain easily in and out of your combos. Which is restrictive, but actually a whole lot easier to understand than Fatal Fury 2's more implied rules, which is just one feature that makes this gameplay tighter than the others. Plus, the timing window for combos is a lot wider, as is the damage from normals a lot lower, meaning the focus here is on chaining specials into your combos, and turning the joystick in and out of quarter circles in the middle of frantic button mashing action is always a good time. The resulting splash of colorful sprites and detailed movements is a satisfying visual payoff, although mechanically speaking, the Fatal Fury of 98 feels like a throwback to 93. Oh my god. They ruin shock troopers! How the hell do you ruin shock troopers? It looks so bad, and it sounds so bad. Pursuit of the Mario Unit. And it plays so bad. You just spam your shots and your jump, and there's barely a window of vulnerability. Even then, it switches between sections of extreme easy mode where nothing can touch you, and then suddenly spams the whole screen with enemies who kill the frame rate or just throw you into a straight up trap. I can't believe how much waiting you have to do in this game. This is Shock Troopers, and it feels like you spend half the game just standing around waiting for the next script to happen. I, I, I can't stand to see this. It's a gruesome, gory mess. Let's just move on. The original release of Metal Slug 2 was kind of an infamous event within SNK. Later compilations and ports, even an early one for the PS1, had fixed the frame rate issues of the original arcade release. And as fans looked at the code, and physically modified the cartridge to account for it, they discovered that the original game's code was causing frames to drop at an exponential rate. If the engine skipped one frame, game logic would lag by two frames. Three frames of graphics chug would slow gameplay down by four. And thus we have Metal Slug X, an arcade solution to fixing Metal Slug 2 by not simply re-releasing it, but rather throwing in a handful of extras as well. In addition to fixing the frame rate, we have new weapons, new enemies, rearranged power-up locations, and unfortunately, a return to the unforgiving quarter crunch of the first game. Much of that fancy new enemy placement is pungent aged cheese. Which puts me in quite a pickle. Maybe those anthology re-releases of Metal Slug 2 are actually the definitive way to play it. It's anyone's guess why they didn't make a follow-up to Garou. This game is an absolutely sublime fighter in the same way that The Last Blade was a sublime fighter. For starters, it has the same cinematic loading screens. <laughs> this is the most top quality sprite work we're going to see for some time outside of Metal Slug. And it's used for a tight, back-to-basics new IP with only 12 fighters whose movesets are all perfectly balanced against each other. Fighting is smooth, with lots of wispy vertical swipes and a generous quarter-circle detection window that makes pulling off these ridiculous ultra combos happen actually quite a lot. 
You've got this top meter system where a certain portion of your health meter slowly revives you and enables your super, but if you block at the last second, you get a big revive. It takes place in the Fatal Fury universe, going back to the South Town from the original games, and Terry's a playable character, meaning you get to hear him say... One. This guy's name is Butt, this game is fantastic, and it's such a fountain of polish that it could almost be seen as a reboot of SNK's fighting formula itself. And it kinda was, by starting off a new Fatal Fury spin-off series with no returning characters except for Terry Bogard, the company mascot himself. But in that respect, it was a failed reboot. Without any blockbuster successes for home consoles, SNK's health as a company was tied to the health of the entire arcade industry. And since we're at 1999, that can't be good. Dwindling sales of the original Neo Geo arcade hardware had the company running in the red and soon bought out by Aruz, who did little to support the new SNK projects that would slowly trickle out over the next few years as opposed to the deluge of sub-franchises within franchises that they were pouring out over the past decade. Last Blade and Guru weren't reliable classic IPs, so harder times meant exploiting more recognizable brands. Their competition with Capcom was now canonized with its own game series, but Capcom received most of their revenue, so SNK's developers were forced to focus on, and profit from, more Samurai Showdown, more KOF, and of course, more Metal Slug. A lengthier, girthier, and more challenging Metal Slug that might have been what the developers thought was a final chapter. Giant enemy crabs, zombies, and aliens show up for an even more absurd, and thematically climatic, entry that's also the hardest in the series by a huge margin. You're up against attacks you can't outrun, attacks you can't see that aren't telegraphed, and screens full of moving parts obscuring the deadly little bullets that actually matter. There is a line where this is reasonable, and we have passed it long, long ago. Metal Slug might have represented the least amount of value per quarter that arcades ever offered. It's amazing that this manages to seem so cruel, even compared to KOF's infamously cheesy AI. In which case, we have KOF 2000, a solid entry, but not a fan favorite like 98. Maybe because it traded off the technical depth of 98 for some flashy and overpowering extra moves like the striker tag team attack that has a fourth character leap in and swipe at the air in the middle of your combo. You have combination inputs for toggling counter and armor modes, which require you to do some spider fingery trickery, but nonetheless, they give you an easy way to experiment with new styles in the middle of a match. Fast forward one year, though, and things are getting dire. It's not easy to expect good things from a studio called Noise Factory. Sengoku 3 is a weird choice for them to include in this collection. It's the only beat em up on this list, and there's no way it can be the best. There's just no way. The game's slow. It's stiff. Your combos don't execute unless they connect, meaning that any single missed swing leaves you wide open for a thousand different counterattacks. Once you do get a combo going, there's no easy way to make it stop. Your character is just not very controllable. The window for depth connection is incredibly narrow. The art's not great. There's a lot of palette swapping going on, and there's just three stages. The whole thing seems under-animated and awfully low-budgeted compared to SNK's other releases of the time. Which makes sense, since they were actually bankrupt. Aruz put SNK into bankruptcy only to sell their newly acquired assets back to the people who originally owned them. Founding executives who left SNK upon seeing bad tidings formed the company that would eventually become SNK Playmore. They acquired the bankrupt original SNK's assets to put out a cash-strapped KOF 2001 to dismal reviews. But after a year of effectively reforming their own company, SNK Playmore now had the time and the motivation for a more polished KOF 2002. A no-nonsense, no-distractions dream match that's much in the vein of KOF 98. The strikers and armor modes are gone, and a huge list of technicalities is in. Which wraps up this list with the last official game for the Neo Geo, Samurai Showdown 5 Special, which is an updated re-release of the previous year's installment. And even back in 2004, this stuff would have been considered retro. Which doesn't mean it's a bad game, it's a perfectly fine fighter, but it's unfortunately evocative of where the company was at the time, and maybe where they went wrong. This came out in 2004, the same year Half-Life 2, World of Warcraft, and Doom 3 were coming out. While Capcom was producing cutting-edge, sixth-generation console hits for franchises developed specifically for gaming at home, SNK was making products that were literally a decade behind the times. 
And in the world of video gaming, times were changing monumentally fast during the turn of the millennium. But 15 years ago, without an arcade, there really was no home for SNK. There was no cheap digital distribution platform for short little arcade games like these. There was no safe haven for pixel art and 2D concepts, and not even much of an interest in competitive fighting games like there is now. Which might mean that a classic Golden Age-style SNK could fare better nowadays than they did 15 years ago. But back then, they were still banking on staying in the arcade, which was probably the one space where niche Japanese games like these were at their most vulnerable. And even then, after the bankruptcy and the consolidation of their releases, the lengthy hands-on time for maintaining their style of pixel work, plus the dwindling amount of professional pixel artists in Japan, meant that SNK's visual style was becoming too expensive to maintain. Scaling up the KOF sprites for the HD games meant that each character took anywhere from 14 to 16 months to draw. It's a workload that ultimately wasn't worth it. SNK has recently decided to come back from a six-year pachinko break to take another stab at what may be their only two active franchises left. KOF 14 is incoming with nary a sprite in sight. Meanwhile, Metal Slug is now relegated to mobile tower defense games. It's ironic that while SNK's top quality professional pixel work may be a thing of the past, a standard just about two notches below is the default for countless tight-budgeted indie games. And while relying on dated arcade platforms for tech and funding was a bad idea at the end of the 90s, we now have these same kind of experiences thriving on digital marketplaces. But despite their antiquated time and place, SNK's lineup isn't hard to play nowadays at all, nor do they even look worse for their wear. As a stable producer of hardcore content for a small audience of price-ignoring enthusiasts, and by doing a damn good job of it for over a decade, they were somewhat of an underdog. But at the same time, they still exhibited the same traits of the slimiest big Japanese corporations, like keeping their developers anonymous, showing a complete disregard for localization, haplessly selling everything away to the pachinko business, and stubbornly refusing to change their models to suit the times, all the while trying to be this huge fourth pillar of the industry with their own home consoles and portables. And that's why going through these antique games wasn't just a blast from the past. It was also a vision of an alternate future where, with a set of different priorities, SNK could have been that strong and influential pillar of the new arcade. They could have been supporting and developing top-notch pixel art Twitch challenges for the Steam and PSN store's budget sections, or hell, maybe even their own. They were the kings of the arcade back then, so what would have needed to happen for them to carry that torch on to today? 